My brothers, my sisters, we have a very special guest with us here that we love so much, Khalid Yassin, who is a sociologist. He carries a master's degree in sociology and a full-time da'i attracted thousands of people to Islam. Many of them, mashallah, accepted Islam. Our brother Khalid Yassin is uh, making a serious effort around the world to introduce people to Islam and to give people the delicious taste of Islam. Jazakallah khair. We welcome him, we love him, and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, he will be, inshallah, a regular visitor and teacher for the Muslim community in Canada. My brothers, my sisters, dear believers, respected elders, we have a very special guest with us here today, a very special brother for our community, for the Muslims and the non-Muslims. We have your favorite Sheikh, Khalid Yassin. I welcome our brother and full-time brother now. We love you very much here, the, your first visit in Toronto. And uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, uh, we'd like to chat a little bit take this opportunity and let me ask you the first question about this important phenomena. I understand there is a phenomena in this world which is the decline of Christianity and the increase of Islam. Can you explain this to us please? Alhamdulillah. First of all, I'd like to um, uh, express my gratitude for this invitation and this opportunity to uh, share um, some advice uh, for our public and also for the Muslims. Uh, in regard to the question of the, the, the decline of Christianity and the, uh, the rise of Islam, uh, I, I don't want that statement to be uh, sort of like an assumption. Uh, I want it to be very clear that uh, if, if, uh, if, if our um, public will um, check uh, Amnesty International, if they will check the World Health Organization, if they will check the, uh, the official statements of the Vatican Church and the Anglican Church, uh, they will find that uh, there's been a tremendous decline in the presence of worshipers and, and the presence of the church in the lives of the people. Uh, and this is, of course, very uh, unfortunate, but there are some sociological reasons for that. Um, at the same token, uh, it is very clear that uh, there are many people who are saying that uh, Islam is the, uh, is the second largest religion uh, in the Western civilization. And although that is true, I think that the more accurate thing to say is that uh, Islam is the first uh, active religion or system of life in the Western world. And why I make that distinction is because uh, is Islam has shown that it is comprehensive in its approach. Uh, it is therapeutic in its approach. Uh, Islam has shown that it is not just a religion of rituals. It is not just the issue of people become, being Muslims and belonging to the church or the mosque. Uh, it is that people accept Islam as a covenant between themselves and God. Then that covenant has its effect upon the reformation of the individual, the reformation, therefore, of their family, uh, the reformation of the community, and the reformation and the reconstruction of this general society. And this is seen in the, in the, the, just in the issues of the habits and the behavior and the convictions of people in, in their manners. And so I think that uh, this phenomenon can be best explained that at one time in Western civilization, uh, the church was a, central, uh, uh, was a central vehicle in preserving the family. Uh, the church was a central issue in, in giving stabilization of the moralities in the society. The church was a central vehicle for guiding people's lives. And somewhere uh, along the line, especially in the last 20 years, the church has lost that central position. It is no longer dictating the, 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 mo the morals of the society. It can, it can, no, it can no longer uh, stop or slow down the onslaught of corruption and immorality that's taking place through drugs and prostitution and uh, uh, other kinds of godlessness. Uh, the other thing is that it is very clear that um, only one out of 10 people who claim to be Christians are going to the church. They're no longer in the church, even if they are claiming to be Christians. Um, and if you j just check Ireland and Scotland in particular, they haven't ordained even one priest in the last uh, year or two. So if there's no more priests being ordained, this is like a company is producing uh, cars. If they're not producing any more cars, they don't need any more mechanics. So if the church is no longer ordaining priests, it's very clear, you know what I mean, that uh, the church doesn't have a need or a place in that society because priests are there to offer pastoral care. 
So it's like a society is no longer producing any doctors. This means the people don't have any need for the medicine. So this is unfortunate because we do believe that Christianity is one of the great monotheistic faiths. And certainly there's a need for religion in the lives of the people, whether Christianity or Judaism or Islam or any other monotheistic faith in our opinion. But the fact is that perhaps the church, not Christian values, but the church has no longer, is no longer in touch with the social, political, um, uh, psychological issues of the people any longer. And that Islam, on the other hand, has the capacity to re-inspire and to rejuvenate uh, the lives of people. And another part of this phenomenon I, I'd like to mention is that uh, there was a time in which people thought that only poor people, um, people who were disenfranchised people, uh, because they were desperate and they had nothing else to choose from, that they were accepting Islam because of those reasons. Well, obviously, uh, we could put that, uh, 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 that assumption to the side because today the people that are accepting Islam, they're not third world people. Uh, they're not Asians or Africans or uh, they're not poor people or disenfranchised people. These are middle class, educated, sons and daughters of uh, doctors and lawyers and architects and senators and congressmen and, uh, uh, and uh, judges and um, uh, people who themselves are part of the, uh, the, the, the governmental infrastructure. Their sons and daughters are accepting Islam in France, in Germany, in, in Netherlands, in, uh, in, in Ireland, in Sweden, in Scotland, in the uh, UK, and in, uh, uh, in America, and Un United States of America, and of course here in Canada. So I think that it's a phenomena that we need to examine. Uh, it's a phenomena that it cannot be taken lightly. And it's, of course, it has nothing to do with the issues of just uh, um, religious ritualism. Taib Sheikh, Jazakallah Khair for this explanation, an interesting explanation. Now, since Islam is so attractive for people and the hearts grappling Islam, and this phenomena is a real phenomena, the increase of Islam, why this label that they're trying to stick on Muslims, they're trying to stamp on a Muslim baby diapers, terrorist and terrorism, why this labeling? Well, I think it's only fair to say, um, and I have to be objective about this issue, and let me first be objective from the point of taking responsibility for Muslims. Uh, in the Muslim world, there's a great bit of discontent, uh, frustration, um, um, and I think rightly so. When Muslim lands have been invaded, uh, when the, the morals and the principles and properties of Muslims have been, um, have been marginalized, uh, when Muslims are being uh, treated um, in, in uh, less than a human fashion uh, and this kind of uh, pathology uh, has pr created pathological behavior in some cases. So uh, while I never c will justify and we Muslims will never justify um, criminality uh, or in any f way, shape or form, uh, whether it be terrorism or whether it be any anything else or corruption for that matter, we never will justify this. But we also have to say that uh, Islam is against uh, retail terror and wholesale terror. Uh, Islam is against uh, individual terror and is against also state terror. Uh, Islam is against uh, individual crimin 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 uh, criminals and institutional criminality. So Islam is against uh, uh, oppression and repression, both. Um, and, and as such, I'd like to say that um, uh, when some people over long periods of time have been backed against the wall and deprived of their rights and treated in an inhuman fashion, uh, the people whom they see to be the principles of this oppression, they start to react because maybe they don't have the sophistication, they don't have the education, they don't have the patience, uh, they don't have the, the stamina, and they think that there's nothing else they can do except lash out. Well, we say Islamically, they're lashing out. This acts of frustration is wrong. It is unprincipled. In, in the course of doing so, they harm themselves. They harm innocent people. And this is also wrong. But we also have to say that whomsoever it is, whether a state or whether an individual or a group of individuals who have provoked this kind of hostility, who have provoked this kind of frustration, who have provoked this kind of criminal and pathological behavior, whoever has provoked it is also equally as guilty as those who have done those crimes. This is to, to, to deal with one end of it. Therefore, um, I would like to say that, yes, uh, there are a small percentage of Muslims in the world who are malcontent, who are dissidents, 
who are frustrated and who therefore take it upon themselves to just uh, seek reprisals in any way that they can. Those who do that are criminals and we should be against them. Our hands should be against them as Muslims and we should join our hands with the hands of anyone else to be against them, whether their reprisals and their criminal activity takes place in their own countries or whether it takes place here in our country. We should be against that. At the same token, we, our hands should be collectively against two things, evaluating, thinking, and removing the justifications for the provocation against those kinds of people that are producing that kinds of behavior. Because if we don't go to the core of an issue, we're not going to address the whole issue. We can't just say that some Muslim countries or some Muslim communities or some Muslim people, even if they are the small minority which they are, are producing this kind of actions. We can't say that's not enough. We have to say why, under what circumstances. We have to be very objective in our thinking about this here. So on the basis of this, I say the war on terror has got to include uh, the people who are reacting as terrorists and the people who are producing that terrorist activity too. Then I have to also say that we Muslims, in many cases, the 95% of the Muslims or the 97% of Muslims who are law-abiding, decent, hardworking, um, um, uh, good and constructive citizens, uh, unfortunately many of them are coming from uh, cultural, traditional backgrounds, uh, where they don't really uh, um, understand and they don't really uh, integrate or assimilate into Western civilization. They have been pushed into Western civilization. They don't understand how it functions. They don't understand or have an appreciation of its institutions. Therefore, they themselves are, are not assimilating. They're coming here and they're living in cultural pockets of isolation. And if they're living here under cultural pockets of isolation, it means that they're going to be misunderstood and others are going to misunderstand them. And when you have people who misunderstand each other, then if some accusations are made, it's likely that an accusation can be, uh, can be accepted. I say that we Muslims, from our side, we have to repel this idea of terrorism, fanaticism, extremism, radicalism, heathenism. We have to repel that idea by our behavior, not by our reaction. We have to show that we are middle of the road people. We are constructive people. We have something to offer the society. We are educated people. We are people of morals. We are people of ideals. We are people understand, who love the idea of pluralism, of democracy, of open society. And we have to be open-hearted and we have to be open-minded and open-handed in our dealing with our neighbors and our colleagues and our co-workers. Uh, this is what we Muslims have got to uh, instill in the Muslims that we come in contact with, whether in Canada or North America or any place else in the Western world. So we repel in the ideas of our neighbors. Uh, we repel uh, uh, the idea uh, uh, in, in the minds of our co-workers and our colleagues. We repel this idea so that if governments or groups say these things, our neighbors, our co-workers, our uh, colleagues will say, that is not true because I know the Muslims that I live next to. If we don't do this, then it is possible that we can be framed. This is one. On the other hand, we have to admit that people of different persuasions and philosophies and ideas, whether it be uh, governmental groups or political groups or social groups, they have their own justifications. They have their own prejudices. They have their own apprehensions. And they have their own fears as to why they don't want Islam to be recognized as legitimate. And because of that, these groups in many cases, they are very well endowed groups. They are using a, a vast amount of resources for media and other things to paint Muslims and Islam with one black brush. One black brush. Islam, Muslims, fanaticism, extremism, radicalism, terrorism. So in the minds of the human beings, when they think Islam, that's what they think. And they're spending a tremendous amount of money, a tremendous amount of time. As, uh, as we know, in the, in the 20s and the 30s uh, in, this in this country and uh, North America in general, we know there was a, something called the McCarthy era. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a senator by the name of Joseph McCarthy, and he put this blanket on the liberals. Whoever was a liberal was a communist. And so whoever was a liberal and a communist, they were just like the boogeyman. And so the boogeyman, you know, was like to paint it with some kind of black brush. Uh, they're going to destroy our society. They're going to undermine democracy. And they were placed in jail. They were blackballed. They were undermined. Uh, some of them, you know, was run out of the country on the basis of somebody calling them commies, communists. So today, almost 100 years later, we have a new boogeyman in town. The new boogeyman, Islam. 
the new boogeyman, Muslims. And what are they supposed to be doing? Undermining democracy, under derailing the whole idea, you know, of dignity and honor and so forth and so on. That is not true. And the, the irony of the issue is that if any individual with an open mind, with an open heart, reads the Quran for themselves, looks to the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, for themselves, it look to the sources of Islam for themselves, they will see just the opposite than what is being said. And uh, another, um, uh, we, another phenomenon that we want to say is that, you know, in spite of whatever people will say, Islam is this, the Quran is this, Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, is this, the Muslims are this and the Muslims are that. If you put a clean glass of water on the table here and a dirty glass of water over here, and some people say, this clean glass of water, this is Islam. This dirty glass of water, this is, this is something else. If the people chose only the glass for, by themselves, what they will choose? They will always choose the clean glass of water. Yeah. This is human nature. And Islam appeals to human nature. And no one can stop that which appeals to human nature. The problem with, with, with us Muslims, we are not realizing that we are the caretakers of a great treasure. But we're not opening up the treasure box and letting people to see. So we are sometimes blocking the way. Sometimes we ourselves are creating the distortion. And I think when we Muslims begin to remove ourselves away from the equation of the distortion, people will start to see the treasure and will, will select for themselves, whether it be governmental leaders, even people that are within the church, people within our community, political leaders, people in the business community will start to see that Islam is a viable alternative for the reconstruction and the reformation and the reorganization of the Western world. We're not saying subversion. We're not saying destruction. We're saying reconstruction, reformation, reorganization. And this is what made this country and other places in the Western world what made it great. Reconstruction, uh, um, uh, 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 um, reformation, uh, and reorganization. And this is what we say, and also revitalization. And this is what I believe that you will find that Islam will offer, inshallah, to Western society. Uh, Farid Yassin. So my brothers, my sisters, uh, Sheikh is telling us something would remind us of the great ayah in the Quran, which is the whole Quran is great. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ لِيُضُلُّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَسَيَنْفِقُونَهَا ثُمَّ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهُمْ حَسْرَةً ثُمَّ يُغْلَبُونَ وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمِ يَحْشَرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that this great power that they are spending their money, the kuffar, Allah said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا The kuffar spending their money to divert people from the way of Allah they will spend it. Allah confirmed that they will spend it. It will be an agony upon them. They will be sorry. They will be defeated in their effort. And to the hellfire, they will be shoved. Those who are trying to dirty Islam and to divert people from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are spending millions and millions. My brothers, my sisters, what are we spending from our time and money to remove the dirt that thrown at Islam and to polish the true picture of Islam. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. This will make us uh, come to the end of this great interview. MashaAllah, Jazakallah khair. Now, since Islam is so attractive for the regular people, Islam, MashaAllah, is a, for social reform and for the happiness of humanity in general. Why is not being promoted by governments? I think this is a, um, a very crucial uh, question. And uh, I want to be um, um, I want to be very serious and um, uh, thoughtful uh, in my response to it. Uh, let me say this: I think that uh, for the most part, our elected officials, um, the people who are the, who have the cus cu custodial responsibility of government, I don't say that for the most part these are conspiratorial people. No, I think these are people who are representing the general interests of the public. Uh, but in some cases, we Muslims are not active in the general interest of the public. So if we're not active in the general interest of the public, uh, there's a statement they make in playing the lotto. They say you have to be in it to win it. You must be in it to win it. So we Muslims must be involved in the society if we want to win over the hearts of the society. If we want to change the ideas and the persuasion and the feelings and the sentiments of the public, we must affect the sentiment of the people who are the public leaders. So we Muslims have got to send our leadership with the mandate. They must meet and talk with people of government. They must meet and talk with people of business. 
the people who uh, affect the hearts and minds of people, the elected officials. We will sit with them and we must offer to them what we consider to be the Islamic uh, perspective on the problems of the society. For instance, uh, I think that we Muslims need to, um, we need to mandate a group of Islamic intellectuals and leaders who themselves uh, uh, have expertise in the fields of economy and finance and uh, um, uh, human resources, uh, uh, sociology and psychology and medicine and education. And this think tank of Muslims, they need to sit with the leadership of the non-Muslims and, and uh, come to an agreement as to the critical issues facing our society, whether North America or Western civilization in general, then we must come up with what we consider to be um, a, um, a manifesto on how we will approach um, these particular problems. Because Islam is not only just a religion of rituals, uh, there are two words that we need to keep in mind when it comes to the presence of Islam in a society. Islam provides for us a furqan. This means a criterion for our conduct and our behavior, to know right from wrong. Second thing, Islam gives the human being and the society a makhraj, a way out. A way out means uh, solving the problems. If we Muslims are not showing people the distinction, the furqan, and we're not showing the people a way to solve the problems, then it is not enough that we're coming with a new set of rituals. But I say this think tank, of, of Islamic intellectuals and leaders who are representing different components of expertise in the society. They need to be mandated by the leadership of the Muslims to sit down and to write um, different white, uh, what they call it, white papers, you see, on the problems and their solutions and put all these together into some kind of a manifesto, submit this to the government, submit this to the elected leaders, and ask the government to take 15% or 12% or 20% of the revenue that they are using uh, 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 in different ways that are not producing the productivity itself, not giving us the productivity, but give it over to a faith-based initiative. This is the terminology, a faith-based initiative. That means initiatives that are born out of people who are faith-based. Because they are faith-based, they have the reason and the, the, and the volition and the, and the and the, uh, they have the, the, the feeling to, to deliver services to the community. They have a feeling for the community. And so, but I think it's not enough for us to say that the government needs to, uh, to provide us uh, with these kinds of funding. No, we must provide the government with the rationale that we are able to deliver those services. And I think if we were to do this here, some of our elected officials um, uh, would start to see that it would be in their interest as an elected official. It would be in the interest of their constituency. It would be in the interest of the government itself to build strong relationships with the Muslim community through their leadership and through their intellectuals to help reform and reconstruct and reorganize and revitalize uh, the, the community. My brothers, my sisters, Jazakumullah Khair. If you listen to this particular interview and try to meditate, try to make tadabbur, really you will get a lots of advices and great tips. And these tips, they will work for Muslims, than muslims They will work even for the Prime Minister of Canada. My brothers, my sisters, we have to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change the condition of people unless they change their own condition. Dear believers, Jazakumullah khair. We have to be just not uh, walking and talking. We have to be the book that people will read through our manners and behaviors. We have to be the tallest and widest book that will influence the non-Muslims when they see through us proper Islamic behavior, proper Islamic practice and manners. And we really invite the world to paradise. We are the most compassionate people on earth when we care to invite the world to paradise, invite people to the Jannah and the happy life of Islam. I really sincerely on your behalf, on behalf of the Muslim community in Toronto, in all Canada, we say the best thanks to you, which is 
Jazak Allah khair. Sheikh Khalid Yasin, and would love to see you many, many times. I personally benefit a lot from your classes, from your khutbah, from your DVDs and CDs, and I do urge the Muslim community here in Canada to listen and to learn from our dear brother, full-time brother, Sheikh Khalid Yasin. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to um, to expose uh, my, uh, to offer my advice and to expose my ideas about uh, uh, social reformation for our society. Um, and I'm so very grateful for the opportunity to uh, to speak um, uh, on behalf of Muslims to the non-Muslim in the society and as you mentioned uh, this advice that we're giving we pray that it finds itself and settles itself in the heart and mind of the Prime Minister uh, of this country uh, all the way down uh, to the people who are in the, uh, the just to the common people in the streets itself uh, everyone should find some benefit if they have open mind and open heart uh, and I would like to say that the Life of Peace Foundation um, uh, as well as the uh, Islamic Broadcasting Corporation and the uh, Purpose of Life Television, uh, we have come together and formed a collaboration uh, for the purpose of helping to confront the, the ills of the society, not just the ills of Muslims, but the, the ills of the society, uh, so that we can help to reconstruct and rebuild uh, a good foundation of morality and cooperation among the people of the community and that we can remove the misconceptions and distortions about Islam and Muslims and that we can start to build uh, uh, collaboratives between the faith-based communities whether they be Muslims or Jewish or Christian or, or any other uh, other religion and that we can start to look at the problems that exist in the communities from the ground level from the grassroots level uh, and help build it from that stage all the way up into the governmental level and to we pray that uh, the initiative of the Life of Peace uh, Foundation and the, uh, the Canadian Dawah Association and the Islamic Broadcast Corporation and Purpose of Life uh, TV, that inshallah this collaboration will be positively received and we appreciate so much again the opportunity and we thank your, your, um, your viewers and listeners for this opportunity to address them. Thank you so much.